Rachel, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm doing very well. I'm doing yum yum, dare I say. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yum yum. You know, we're getting closer to it. Mm-hmm. We're getting closer to the yum yum. Yeah. Each passing episode is is our march to the grave of yum yum. So as you people heard, that's Rachel and I'm Ryan here doing our rewatch of Star Trek Discovery for the first time since it aired. So we're getting all the nuggets, all the joys and unfortunately disappointments that sometimes a rewatch has. But let's see what this episode's offering up in terms of that. Huh, Rachel? Are you ready to hear about what episode we had to delve into this week? So, remind me in the audience what pretentious title is the offering for this week. Well, the offering for this week's episode, which is episode 14 of season one, Mm -hmm. so... A long season for modern television. Usually it's like 12 to 13, but 14. And this is the second last episode. So the title is The War Without, The War Within. Ooh. It's moody, isn't it? Yeah. So the CBS description of this episode that's on IMDb goes as such. Back on the USS Discovery, Burnham and the crew are faced with the harsh reality of the war during their absence. In order to move forward, Starfleet must use unconventional tactics and sources to take their next action against the Klingons. Ooh. Isn't that spooky? That makes it sound interesting. It makes it sound like there was a lot going on this episode, because there was a lot going on this episode. Mm -hmm. Rachel, it's our first time seeing this episode again. Yeah. What was your feelings on this episode, despite its title? Because you just made a, you know, you (laughs) proclaimed a moment ago, and you proclaimed at the end of the last episode that the title leaves, it's lacking. But what about the actual episode? Okay. The title itself matches the episode and it clearly identifies the theme that they're dealing with. Yes. Which which is good. Yeah, it has themes. But this episode's a fucking mess. (laughs) So you didn't like this episode? Overall, I did not enjoy this very much. So you didn't... I liked moments Mm. and ideas. But overall, I felt it was messy. You felt that this was a messy episode. Yes. To the point of hampering your entertainment and uh, uh, enjoyment of it. Because sometimes Mm -hmm. with TV, there are messy episodes that are still fun, including Star Trek, including this series of Star Trek. We've had fun with episodes that are a little bit messy around the edges. Sometimes Star Trek Discovery is... A roller coaster. And sometimes that's a roller coaster that I enjoy. And other times it makes me want to vomit. And this is one of the times uh, where it, it just made me confused and mm. feel sick. Yeah. Okay. Because I did not trust that my roller coaster cart was going to stay on the tracks. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. So. Did you hate this episode? Because you get a venom real easily with mm. Star Trek Discovery, especially with episodes that make you feel confused, confounded, or left middling. Yeah. Were you at the point where you thought, do I hate this episode? Because I think about, what is it, episode four or five of mm-hmm. Star Trek Discovery? You were like, I'm not sure if I hate this episode. What do you think of this one? Does it make you have those feelings at all? It doesn't make me hate it. I it, <laughs> um it it's it doesn't make me angry. It just makes me confused and annoyed. It, yeah, not angry. It does it it feels more like I'm watching an animal that should just be put down and put out of its misery. That bad, huh? But like just like <laughs> Like, not, not, not an animal that I care about. Captain Lorca is dead. But I, I agree, this episode's a mess. <laughs> and it is a one of these monumental 
episodes of Star Trek Discovery. It isn't as bad as the, uh, the, was it two, three episodes ago? The one where it was when Ash Tyler was revealed to be a Klingon. I still think thus far that's the worst episode of, of this season. And the one before they leaped into the Mirrorverse where they had to fight, uh, 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 remember that great character? The one with face paint. Remember him? He was so great. Call of House Kor. But this episode is monumental in the fact of it is an example, clearly, of the Star Trek Discovery formula in which so much has happened in the episode. So many things, so many little moments, so many big moments, so many confounding moments, so many weird decisions in terms of, well, that's done for shock value, that's done for, ooh, where will this lead to, that you cannot, after just watching it, remember the full details of the episode because we're going to talk about it and there's going to be things you'll bring up and I'll be like oh shit oh yeah and there's going to be things I bring up and you're going to be like that this episode is the blueprint like we said about previous ones of the Star Trek formula of shoving in so much Discovery's formula of shoving in so many things and I've been constantly saying my big criticism of this show from an episode by episode basis is focus Mm -hmm. focus in on the story being told but there comes a point and we've been at this point later in the season where it isn't so much oh I wish the B story had more focus or I wish it was just focusing on this aspect of the story we're at this point now where there's so many disparate elements you can no longer validly say that criticism early on in this season I was saying to you in one of the episodes uh, that oh This episode, I could fix easily by just saying, focus more time on this. This one, I don't know how you can fix it with the way it's structured because there is just so much going on that if you had to fix it, you'd have to completely rewrite it, completely scrap it, completely do something different. And that is a core fundamental problem that we have with Star Trek Discovery is episodes just aren't an episode of television and they are just... It's like you're cramming in one season's worth of stuff in one episode, yeah. each episode. And it is a lot to take in. Okay, so Thus I... Thus it becomes a mess. Yeah. I can think of four relatively distinct plots that are happening in mm-hmm. this episode. And some of them are more connected th- than others. Like, they're, they're, they think they're the same thing. Mm. Like mm. It, 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 the episode and the writer seem to think that it, like it's presented the a plot, but everything feels different and separate and not fully connected. It doesn't feel cohesive. Well, I'm going to ask you, what is the central plot of this episode? Them changing their tactics and heading to Kronos. No. No. The central plot of this episode is Michael forgiving Ash. That's the central plot. That's the thing driving every single scene. The let's deal with Kronos is the framing device that that holds around. But the actual story is about how is Michael going to forgive Ash Tyler? Because at the end of every Mm -hmm. sequence, at the end of every scene, it is, oh, Michael. Oh, Michael, you've got to open your heart again. Oh, Michael, stop shutting yourself off. Oh, Michael, you've made emotional decisions. Make this one the right one. The episode wants it to be the story about Ash and Michael. Yes, the for the narrative heft to be lifted off, you have the Kronos thing, but that is the kind of the B plot in a way, because how much time do we actually focus on them coming up with a solution to that? Not really. See, I think of... They're doing the thing of uh, the A plot to me is the the narrative force and B plots tend to be more about the emotional experiences of the characters. That's why I place it in that way. But the episode spends more time on the Michael plot about Ash than it does about the solving Kronos plot. Because that's for next episode. But, That's for next episode, the Kronos plot. We're going to solve that next episode. We're setting it up for next episode. Did you notice that we set it up for next episode? 
Yes, but as you pointed out, a lot of those scenes end with it being about Ash and Michael, but they start with being conversations about the war and heading to Kronos. But I would still argue that, for one, 25% of the Kronos plot is wrapping up the Lorca plot. So 25% of the Kronos plot is already gone. I think that's an overestimate. No, not really, because I keep bringing him up during the episode. But a lot... In, like, a the good... first 10 minutes. And yeah, of a 40-minute show. Of a 40-minute show, you spend 10 to 15 minutes wrapping up Lorca's stuff, coming to terms with it. And I'm not saying they do this satisfactorily. This is what we're going to get into. I agree with that. But, but they do spend time talking Lorca. Let's do this stuff. They spend okay. time to go, here's why the Lorca plot is no longer going to affect the main plot anymore because it's classified. Yeah. yeah. We will get into Lorca, but what I'm just saying is the mess of this episode is the answer is there is no real A plot or B plot or C plot. They're all the A plot. They're all the A plot because they all are important except for when they're not because we have to rush through them. Paul just casually terraforms a whole entire moon and that's like a big universe lore thing. Like, uh. Ratha Khan is all about someone coming up with technology to terraform a moon, terraform yeah, a planet. He, is, he can just do just, it in one line because we just, don't have time. We don't have time. We have exactly no time to discuss the metaphysical implications. Let's just do some housekeeping stuff in terms of carrying over criticisms from the last episode. Uh, we talked about Lorca. Mm-hmm. And one of the things we talked about was how disappointing Lorca's conclusion was for us. He turns into a very two-dimensional villain with no layers. He's an evil man and he dies. He's an evil man and he dies. I can't think of a movie where where I like it that that the bad guy gets dumb. Because it's like, I want want the bad guy to be smart, smart, smart. So the good guy has to be even smarter. This episode gives the... um, the really the only closure on the fact that we spent a whole season with a man who had turned a Starfleet crew and technically Starfleet into an authoritarian military organization that profited off of his bloodthirsty tactics. We spent a whole season with that man. He is wrapped up in two sentences of dialogue and they shoot his fortune cookies with a phaser or or blaster, it looked like more so. You spend a whole season with this guy, living, breathing, watching him manipulate this crew, manipulate the Federation into a Terran Empire solution to things. Mm -hmm. We wrap up that character and that stuff with just them going, ugh. I can't believe that we didn't notice. And the wrapping up is just them saying, oh, well, it's over now, and now we can move on. There is no reflection. There is no commentary. What he offered to the season, nothing happens. He is dead. Nothing matters. No, and that could be fine (laughs) if he was a short-time character, if he was a one-off character, if he was in a singular episode. They need to win the war. They have to move on. I know. I know this, Rachel, but stop <laughs> stop being dickish for a second and just let's literally talk about this because it is one of the huge core fundamental problems that we have for this first season because we liked Lorca. We were enjoying his journey. We were enjoying it on the rewatch, but it's always been a dissatisfying ending because they have to do so much like busy work to wrap up this problem that they made for themselves, which is Captain Lorca. Yeah. Oh, what happened to the Terran discovery ship? Oh, well, it just died. It just was destroyed. Yeah. That's a line. A singular line. That, that So that's wrapped up. Uh-huh. That, that, that thread of intrigue wrapped up in one line. Oh, what about what happened with the fact that our whole entire crew got contaminated by someone who led us down the road of authoritarianism? Oh, it's wrapped up because we shot his fortune cookies. It's wrapped up. And None of us have to. And called him a bastard. And it's wrapped up. We don't have to. We don't. And the important question: Where's the good Lorca? Where's the Prime Universe Lorca? Oh well, by the way, we heard that how you guys had to survive. A single Starfleet captain could not survive in that universe. And all I have to say to that is, 
that is the laziest explanation as to why they're not going to have Jason Isaacs come back as Prime Walker. It was, oh, well, well, no one from our universe could survive in there. Why? If Lorca and Lorca are the same guy, but one's evil and one's good, it stands to reason that the good Lorca would also be strong enough, smart enough, capable enough to survive. Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. But they don't want to, so they don't. It's just such a disappointment because they just do wrap him up. And we've been saying, we've been praising that it was so great that this show took an interesting idea, which was what happens if we saw a crew from its perspective fall in line with a corrupt captain? And whether it ended the way we wanted to or not in terms of like, oh... The, the crew dies, or something happens, and they overthrow the captain. They did all that, but what should happen is they should have some terms of reflection on the fact that they themselves as individuals, Saru, Mr. I'm Starfleet, Michael, Miss I'm the Best, none of Honey. them reflect on the fact that they were led down the road of evil. Honey, you seem to be forgetting a fundamental flaw of discovery. Mm. Nothing matters. Stop saying that. I know that that's the case that we keep saying, but isn't it a disappointment? It's a disappointment. I want to but talk about that but th- but critically. That, that is part of it. Because the show relies on the fact that it is keeping your mind busy and it is propelling forward. There is no time to look back back to think critically to evaluate the impact of it because we're just moving forward everything has to go forward we're losing the war we can't talk about this it's classified like um speaking about this particular thing is treason and then that's it but that's see That's the logic that the writers put into the universe of the show for why they're not going to deal with this problem from a narrative perspective. See, we said if we talk about it, you'll be court-martialed and shot to death or whatever. But from a writer's perspective, why did you set up a show where the whole season you are putting us in front of an evil captain? Because because from a pure sci-fi Star Trek standard... The audience is expecting and wanting and needing the good guy, Captain Kirk, Captain Picard character. But you are throwing a, you know, a mystery box twist of, ooh, we're following an evil captain. So if you're going to do that, if you're going to do the we're following an evil captain, wouldn't it be satisfying? Like, wouldn't it be logical? Wouldn't it be needed from a writing perspective to actually follow through on that, because if you're making a commentary on the fact of the matter that so many people who are good can be led astray from a charismatic leader, wouldn't you want to explore or at least attempt any form of the fact that there are repercussions to, to let's be hyperbolic, fall in line with a Nazi? Yeah, I, we've also brought this up before. Um, but I think this episode also illustrates how there are certain lines or moments that under the guise and assistance of a different set of writers with a different purpose Hmm. would be a whole episode. And I think that that Hmm. is the case with a lot of different things in this one episode because the Kronos plot could be a whole episode. The terraforming the moon could be a whole yeah. episode. Sarek and Michael could be a whole episode. Yeah, yeah Tilly yeah. forming the opinion of like we are a product of the people around us could be a whole episode. Well, no, that one I disagree, because that one could have fed into the reflection on we had an evil captain. Yeah. That would have fed into that, and it tries to? Like, that could have been one part of an episode where it's the the crew um, getting a moment to deal with the 
philosophy and actually address those metaphysical questions that Lorca wouldn't give them the time to do. The problem at hand is the Klingon war stuff. Although it was important at the beginning, the show, as we have commented from episode to episode to episode, the Klingon war was a loose framework so that Lorca could come in and drive the narrative of the season, which is how people can be led astray under extreme circumstances. You know, this tyrant can succeed in war times, and we need people like this can thrive in chaos, right? But And that is an idea that Star Trek has dealt with before. Oh, yes. How we cannot assume that we have overcome this hurdle because there will always be people who have these intentions consciously or unconsciously and seek out those opportunities. Yeah, uh, but that was the focus that the show has put of the season is Lorca. So why is it that we don't conclude his story in any satisfying way. We have to rush back to the Klingon plot, which was primarily set up so something like Lorca could exist. What I'm just going to say is, this episode should have been Discovery's equivalent, or they should have an equivalent of the episode Family in The Next Generation, where in The Next Generation, you have the double-parter, best of both worlds, where Picard got assimilated by the Borg. Mm -hmm. It's a huge episode, groundbreaking, Iconic. Huge. How do they follow it up? They follow it up with Picard going back to his family vineyard and having a domestic with his brother. And it's all of this trauma from his life has finally boiled over because of this assimilation of the book. And you have other stories within the episode of Worf and his family. And (laughs) it's a moment of breathing and to really kind of conclude the trauma that those two episodes set upon our characters. How come we didn't have an episode like that in season one, in which we have an episode of reflection of the trauma of having a captain who had basically engineered Starfleet into the Terran Empire? Yeah. I and our crew of characters. I also think that reflects a problem of the structure and the pacing of the season as a whole Mm. because that episode like five or so from the end felt like the um episode before the series finale to me because that was the Mm -hmm. episode before Lorca wrapped up yes because that felt like it was the central through line of the season. So it makes it feel like these episodes after are really tacked on. Because they're saying, well, like, yes, look is dealt with, but remember, we're following the war. And it's just like, well, no, because we haven't been paying attention to that. We haven't been part of that. And we get thrown back in nine months after and we're just told, well, everything's shit now. And you should care. What what when what we cared about, what we were focusing on, because the writers made it focus, is the warmonger, yeah. someone who's who's profiting off of a war, not the actual horrors of war, not the actual threat of the enemy of the war, but the threat, dare I say, within. You know, mm-hmm. it's in this fucking title. But why are we focusing on this so much? Because the show didn't focus on it. And they just say it in two quick fire sentences, and that's it. That's Lorca done, wrapped up, fine. He's gone. And he got killed, and that's it. It's wrapped up, up, up. It's done. This episode did one really good job, uh, and but it's also a bad thing, which is this episode, my biggest strength for it was Saru taking leadership. Mm-hmm. This is what I enjoyed. But as I just said, with all this Lorca stuff, the character I think should have had the deepest reflection put upon them was Saru. Saru is Mr. I follow the rules. But out of all of the characters that we had throughout this season, Saru, as much as he may have been sheepish to it, he was the one who followed Lorca's orders the most. He was the one that adopted the fear that Lorca had. The episode in which he was telling 
them to force the creature to comply so that we can follow the orders and stop this war from happening. Saru was the one out of all of our characters who fell in line to Lorca. Does he have a moment of reflection about that? Does he have a moment where he's being a leader and he maybe stops and goes, wait, I'm acting like Lorca? Yeah. No, because and we don't have time. And another thing, just in in that vein, uh, Saru has a, a clear moment when he is he's like doing a walk and talk with Burnham. Um, I'm pretty sure when it's yeah at the very beginning it, at the very beginning of the series, and he says, "I will do a better job protecting my captain than you did," and he didn't, and he didn't, and he shouldn't have. And also, his captain died, and he deals with none of that on screen. Know that I intend to do a better job protecting my captain than you did yours. Was there actually anything good in this episode other than Captain Saru working? And we say that because we think Doug Jones does a great job of emulating that kind of... uh, you know, the Spock Data type character in which they're very, you know, they speak in a very monotone rhythm and they are very intelligent and they aren't the most emotionally resonant character, but yet that makes them resonant. And seeing a character like that in leadership is always fun okay. and fascinating. But is there any other any other things in this episode gonna, that actually were good? I'm going to go through chronologically and a lot of these are relatively small things and some of them are... I'm giving them credit for things that they didn't do, um, which is uh, we did get an external shot of the ship with drones that don't match the technology. But they set them up so when season two happens, it's not weird. Yeah, um, that wasn't what I was going for. But we didn't get a twist, flip, zoom in through a window into the ships. So I, I liked that we didn't get like the flip twist CGI zoom through a window. That was that that was nice. Do you actually have any genuine trick. ones though? Because that that is just they didn't do a thing. That's a positive. But is yeah, there things I, that they actually did do that is a positive? Other than I oh was, they gave us a drone. I said that I was getting to that. I'm just going through my notes in order. Um, I I do like that they address and reinforce the distinction between Vok and Ash. Like, that, just everybody is on board with that and everybody has a clear distinction between the two of them. Soulcraft. Mm-hmm. Psychecraft. Uh, you know, just, just throw out any word. Uh, species reassignment surgery was what they used this episode. It's anything that they want. Medicine in the future, it's magic. Fully functional. I do like um, Tilly scene when she's describing how like we need we to stop ourselves from becoming like them is to understand the darkness within us and fight it. I like that scene as well. I thought Tilly was handled pretty okay for the episode. She did not feel like Tilly, though. She felt like the a writer's tool of, oh, this character is going to do the thing that's the positive. We need a character in the episode to have a positive reinforcement of the message. We need a character to just say nicely. And Tilly, we've said this throughout the show. She changes with whatever episode they need her to. Is she too socially awkward? Is she is she super confident? Is she Guinan now? Mm-hmm. Who knows? And I like the way that some elements of Starfleet values are coming in in that discussion and also like how she says the way that we treat him is who he's gonna become. Mm-hmm. is a very mm-hmm. Starfleet approach to things. Would that scene work better, though, Rachel? Would it work better if we cared about Ash Tyler? Of course it would. But we don't. No. So does that scene work? No, I didn't give it much credit. I just said that there was a glimpse of actual Starfleet values in a Star Trek show. I'm not claiming that it's good or 
high quality or caliber in any regard. So do you have any notes that are that for this episode? That was one. Come on. No, no, like, do you have any notes that are, like, this was a genuinely good thing, not it had the potential or it was an echo or it was... I, they I didn't genuinely do like that scene with Tilly where she is defending Ash and being like, no, we will be defined by the way that we treat him as well as how he reacts to it. And probably the thing with the least amount of caveats that I think was good was the way that Michael called Jojo captain to annoy her. I agree that the Tilly scene was probably the emotional the emotional core of of the the episode. They want it to be the Ash and Michael scene near the end, but that's a joke. <laughs> but I do not connect to that Tilly scene just because it dangles the essence of Star Trek in my face. It would work if I cared about the character that is at the core of that conversation, which is Ash Tyler. But I do not care about Ash Tyler's plight. I do not care about his identity issues is he Klingon is he human what is Ash he's his own individual and they speak about him in the third person it would matter it would matter if you cared about that character there are so many moments in Star Trek in which they have these type of conversations but they're about characters you care about it's about Captain Kirk it's about Spock it's about Picard when these characters are having these issues and we are like we need to be good and we need to defend this thing on our moral stances about this character but Ash Tyler is a jerk and you don't like him. So the scene in which Tilly's like, hey, give him a chance. I'm like, the whole season's been telling me to give him a chance and I have and I don't care about him. Okay. I, 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 I agree with all of that really, but I also, I feel like the best comparison that comes to my mind is... My the- mind to your mind? Everybody gets a mind meld. It's fine. Sarek hands out mind melds, which is a very private and personal and limited thing that they do, like fucking lollipops. Lollipops. Everybody. Everybody gets one. Um, but it feels like a, a very, 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 very watered down uh, version of the experience and the questions that are dealt with in the TNG episode where... Uh, Troy gets impregnated by a space alien and has a... A, a baby that uh, grows a, up super quick. Yeah, for for one episode. That's that's what it feels and like And that episode today. sucks because you don't care. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but it, it, it feels a, a bit more like Star Trek than the rest of it. And I liked it that it did. I'm kind of I didn't get angry at it for dangling it. I was just like, "Oh, oh, oh. They, they, they get something." See, you and I are always flipping on which side of the debate we're on. Rarely have we it feels like been in in unison on a point. But I guess after 14 episodes, second re- this is our first rewatch, so let's say this is literally like this, you know, like I've watched Star Trek Discovery so many times now in hours of of entertainment and watching and now we're reviewing it critically. And I'm kind of sick at the fact that we have to spend, we have to wait 14 episodes and we're still, our our, our positive is, well, it somewhat resembled Star Trek in this one moment in the 44 minutes of episode. And that's a positive critique of the show. When Please. that should be the bare minimum of what Please the show then. needs to deliver. Give us I'm some so... metaphysical crumbs. Come on, come on. I'm do tired it. of it. I, I am tired of it because crumbs. I've been doing it throughout the season. I've been going, oh, well, this moment was nice and this, but they're just moments when it needs to be a whole episode. It needs to be the whole episode. It needs to be the thrust of a show called Star Trek that it is resembling Star Trek. You can go devious and deviate off the formula like DS9 or even Enterprise. And we've talked about this. The ideas are all foundational. They're all solid ideas, but it's about the execution. And here we are, 14 episodes in, and our positives is, oh, well, Saru resembled a Star Trek kind of character when he was captain in this one scene in the episode. Or, oh, Tilly gave a speech that was somewhat reminiscent of values in Starfleet. 
And all of this stuff of the lacking of Star Trek and lacking of Starfleet stuff was excusable because the framing of it was we were following a captain who was disregarding those and forming our characters' opinions into disregarding those too to comply with not being Starfleet. But now that that's over and there's no reflection on that action, why is it still like that? Because that's the show. We have to move forward. But Star Trek is at war, so they obviously abandon their ideals. Of course. Of course. Hence genocide. Hence genocide will happen. But remember, remember that they're only planning to attack military bases on Crown Ice. Until they talk to Hitler herself and she convinces the diplomat, the biggest diplomat in all of Star Trek to perform genocide. But that's for next episode. Uh, that, for, well, yeah. We're not meant to know that yet, though, Ryan. We're not meant to have that figured out. It's almost like she's kind of laying a web, you know, yeah. or, or, or doing her tear and self thinking about the long game. Mm-hmm. And then once you get into uh, the scene with Sarek, she has this information about what Sarek means, yeah. and it's almost like she's wielding it as a weapon yeah. and using it to throw him off a little bit. Did you notice that the acting was really bad in this episode from the majority of performers? Uh, I try not to pay too much attention to that a lot of the time. Unless it's particularly grabbing, mm. um, I think my my general bar for the acting is pretty low. As an actor myself, I try to give credit where credit's due. All of these people are talented in some way, shape, or form. They've proven themselves within this series, out of this series, and so forth. And even direction can be good in this stuff. But the acting was noticeable in this episode. There was many... Most of my notes, I just wrote, acting! Because they were very obviously performing. Not the characters were performing, but the actors. And I think a huge uh, factor to that is, no matter how great of an actor you are, no matter how great of a director you are, the facade of reality will fall away because of the script. And the script in this episode, the lines of dialogue, the way it's written, and that, it, it falls away. The The... The facade that this is real in any way, shape, or form, that these are characters, that that these characters are real, that these aren't actors standing there in makeup and in costumes with the set and the crew in front of them and all of that, is immediately gone. Because if you have a weak script, no matter how great the actor, no matter how great the director, no matter how great the production value, the audience will see through that. And that was this episode's weakness. I think that's my cue to read off some of the quotes that I have written down. Um, A- Ash is reflecting on his experience and giving Saru the details of what happened to him. And this is after he declares that he had a species reassignment surgery. Soul graft. Psyche graft. <sighs> yeah. Whatever. Discussing uh, Vogue and Laurel. Uh, they were in love, you know. And we are supposed to care about that because we remember that. But what does Saru care? Okay, so uh, they're about to terraform a moon randomly, but Stamets hasn't actually explained what he's going to do. He's like set a course for the Veda system and get ready for a show. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's trailer dialogue. Yeah. A lot of the dialogue is that kind of dialogue that they write and show off in a trailer next week on Star Trek Discovery. Get ready for a show. And then they'll cut to some action um, in the trailer. I, I, another weird moment for Sven. Uh, um, I really disliked the goodbye between Sarek and Michael because it it was too emotional and it made me uncomfortable. <laughs> well, it's as we've critiqued throughout Sarek's appearances is not the actor's fault, but the way the character is constructed, that's not Sarek. Yeah. And that is amplified next episode by the fact that the great diplomat Sarek thinks it's logical to perf- to perform a global genocide. Yeah. So that's not Sarek. I'm he, sorry. He says there is no telling what any of us may do when the heart is concerned. I was more perplexed when he said something along the lines of, like, uh, 
he said something weird like about excluding loved ones don't do that kind of thing and i'm like but that's what you do oh yeah that's your mo don't don't make the mistake of like turning your back or, on loved ones or something or, or loved there. ones or, or like feeling like you failed because you fell in love but that's his whole mo but that's not this Sarek, so it's different, so it's fine. Don't think about it. For what greater source of peace exists than our ability to love our enemy? I've made foolish choices. Emotional choices. Well, you are human. Star Trek has always had the criticism of as a franchise that it's cold and these don't feel like humans. I mean, Spock's literally not a full human. And, and because, you know, they stand up there and they're from a utopian future in which all these concepts that are dear to us no longer exist in the same way that they do currently. And there's that common thing of, well, how can I relate to this cold sci-fi show that speaks in nothing but jargon? But that is a misconception if you have not actually watched Star Trek because Captain Kirk is a deeply empathetic character who relates to other characters in ways that we humans can understand. And same with Picard, same with Janeway, same with Sisko, same with all of them. This show, time and time again, glimpses that or touches those moments. But you have scenes like with Ash, Tyler, and Michael. You have scenes like those, in which they do not act like how humans in the current day would, or at least how I would feel. I don't relate to these characters in any way, shape, or form, because they have not just become... They're not just sci-fi characters anymore. They are mythological. They're they're (laughs) mythological characters, because you have lines of dialogue like, I guess our fates echoed across galaxies... How am I supposed to relate to that? Another fate echo is just a statement that she says without question. But there was a point where I got je- I got mad at the episode. And it it was it was just because it just personally made me reflect on things that have happened in my life, which is when Michael is talking with Ash and she um, is saying, like, it was your hands around my neck. And she puts her own hand around her neck. Acting. And as somebody who's experienced trauma, I cannot imagine doing that. Like, in the moment when you are confronted, you are confronting and being confronted with your experiences in front of the person who has assaulted you to be reliving that moment through that statement and putting your own hand where their hand was. And that scene is very confronting in itself in all the wrong ways. Let's talk about that scene because it's the big emotional scene of the episode. It's the it's the scene to make you cry because she's crying and he's crying and it's hilarious because they never stop fucking crying. They're always fucking crying. No, that that actress can cry at the drop of and a hat. And he can too. Which is so an amazing. Whoop de do. No, no, he can, he can screw up his face and put his hand to his mouth. <laughs> he does that a lot this episode, like just covering up his mouth. The scene to doesn't. Show that he's sad. The scene doesn't work for a multitude of reasons. The obvious being that we have no investment in their relationship, so we have no investment in them mending their relationship at all. Um, but they love uh, each other. Though they love each other because their fates echo across galaxies. <laughs> Another reason that the scene doesn't work is we do not like Ash Tyler's argument in the scene as a viewer. There's a moment in which. Michael says that it was your hands, it was you, and, like, you shut off. You were the one that wasn't Vok, that was you. Yeah, you, you shut And she's making all out. of these compelling conversations and arguments and points about you can't just blame the fact that you had a Klingon inside of you that snapped and choked me. There's more to that. And he just retorts with, uh, no. It's your problem that you're having because you realize you fell in love with a Klingon. And he just throws it back onto her. He just throws it back onto her the in a very petty... line is atrocious. 
atrocious. And the way it's delivered is it feels like it's supposed to be that beat of in it, an argument when make... you're having with a loved one and they throw something back onto you it and it's supposed it to sideline you. But in the scene, gross. but in the scene, it's played as, oh, wow, that's a good point. And like, and she goes, perhaps you're right. And, 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 and she takes it. And to me, it would have been the end of the conversation. She should have left. She should have been like, you don't fucking get it. Like, like you literally like, don't bring my dead parents into this. Cause it was a tool in the argument for him to win that he used. And if it yeah, was used like, as that, you are just, you are scared of loving me. It's your and fault. And then you are scared of loving me because of your past. It's, it's not what I did. It's because of what you brought into the situation where I tried to kill you. What? Or even if you cut that bit what? of the what? I tried to kill you, because you could argue <laughs> it was the argument of it's a Vok. It's the fact of she was arguing the but point. Him, him as the physical person yeah, but it was there. Her, but the other point she was bringing up of, you said you were going to trust me. You said you were going to communicate with me. You said you were going to be there for me. You said you were going to do this. And he did none of those. And his retort is, uh, it's your fault because you found out I'm a Klingon. And now you're trying to find any excuse to end it with me. But you don't have the balls to say it's because I'm a Klingon because you don't want to be a racist. And your parents died from Klingons. And that's why you're a racist against me. And it's just so petty. But the scene doesn't play it out as if that was petty. It plays it out as an another heartfelt emotional beat of their long loving relationship that will eventually form again. And don't you feel sorry for Ash Tyler? Because both of them are crying at each other and the camera is spinning in circles around them and the music swelling and the sunset behind them through the through the window and and she says, We created something beautiful today. And it's melodrama. It's melodrama, and that's another reason why it doesn't work, is not only because you don't care about Ash Tyler's stand in the argument, because they both, if the scene was constructed well, they both could have a very mature, heated conversation. They've already had mature conversations. We've talked about it before, but the conversation they had when he revealed his sexual trauma, which of course we know is a lie, yeah. um, in retrospect because it was Vox memory, and I've already talked about my disdain for that choice, but that was a mature conversation. They are capable as a couple, and the writers are capable for writing for this couple to have mature conversations, and you can have mature and heated conversations. There's a literal movie called Marriage Story that deals with this exact idea. But they can't do that in this scene. So you don't care they about could, Ash Tyler Stan. They don't want to. I think that we should not be saying that they can't. Because all of these things, by referencing previous Star Treks or other pieces of media... We or keep, previous episodes of this season. We keep on showing that they could... If they decided to. But they and w- they always have reasons, and we can see those reasons, and we often talk about them. Yeah. But they don't. Because they don't want to hit the emotional beats that the scene needs. They want to hit the emotional beats that they want to ring out for the drama. Sometimes a scene, sometimes a character, sometimes a story doesn't go... To, sh- sometimes when you're creating the story, and sometimes you're creating the characters, you may have an idea of this is where they're going to go. This is what's going to happen. But when you actually start creating those characters, when an actor comes along with the writing, with the production, it it, sh- it, change, it changes, it shifts, it molds into something different. And that includes this type of scene where initially they wanted the scene to be played like this. But with the way everything has been moving with the scene, it should have been played differently. It should have hit these different emotional beats to the to scene because at the end of the day, the scene doesn't work because we don't care about Ash and Michael's relationship. We don't care about Ash Tyler. We don't care about Ash Tyler's argument within the scene. We do not relate to Michael in the scene. The scene is played for melodrama instead of subtlety, maturity, or just genuine drama. And the scene fails at the end of the day because of the reason that this episode fails. You just don't care about anything that's being said or anything that's going on. Because that's my big critique of this episode is as many stories as they can, as many dumb things as there were, I was left with apathy. There was nothing that made me angry. And talking about it with you and having your opinions and your caveats on things that were good and and me having to give those caveats on things that are good, I'm getting angry now. But when I'm actually watching the episode, when I just watched it, 
I was left going, I can barely remember the details of it because it was so jam-packed. But what I do remember is I don't care. I just was left emotionless after the experience. And it wasn't one of those, the episode was so tragic and so heartfelt and so emotional that it leaves you emotionally devastated. So when after you watched it, you're emotionless, like you're, 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 you're trampled. No, 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 no. I was just left with apathy. And that scene, mm-hmm. you just go, oh, I, I don't care. Just move on to the next scene. Who the hell is Tyler? You think I know anymore? You think I have any idea who I am now, where I belong? This isn't about a lie. This is about you looking for an excuse to end it. Excuse? My crewmates have been kinder than they need to be. Why are you, the person who knows me best, so quick to turn your back? Stop. I want you to admit it. Admit that you can't do this anymore because you finally went there with someone, then things got complicated. Because your parents were killed by Klingons and you fell in love with one. (gasps) You need something funny? Yeah. You know this episode was serious because they were dealing with the Klingon war, right? Yeah. And you know how you knew it was serious? Because all the characters at some point um, lowered their zippers on their uniform or had it completely undone. So you know things are a bit tense right now because they can't even wear their uniforms properly. Yeah, casual, I was noting, casual I, Tilly. <laughs> I was noting it down. Every scene had a character where they lowered the zipper on their uniform so that they were looking like they're haggard and tired and, oh, war is hell, like the yeah. Admiral. We see Admiral in her pyjamas, Yeah, guess, we is saw what that was. Uh, yeah, but... I thought that was very funny, like the shorthand that they were doing there yeah. via the visuals of like, oh, I see, see, war's hell. They've got their zippers undone. Mm-hmm. You know, that means that war's hell, they're, right? Their zippers exhausted. are undone. They're exhausted. They're overworked. They can't even do up zippers. They can't even do up. <laughs> they can't even do up their zippers, Rachel. Oh, boy. That is the defining moment um, of the collapsing federation is the zippers. And there's nothing really much else in the episode other than George O is here and it just really she's reminds been, you... She's uh, now been installed as our universe's George O long, long lost, finally discovered. I don't understand what the choice is there. Mm-hmm. I, like, other than, oh, it's a dramatic reveal yeah, for the audience, yeah. but... I know where the story goes. We know where that story goes. But I still don't buy that the Admiral, who has just found out that the previous captain of of this ship was a Mirrorverse captain who had fooled them all and played them all like a fiddle, will then let the literal emperor of that galaxy in which they were so evil, that that this character is so evil and manipulative, it drove Lorca, the evil Lorca, to do these evil things in our universe to get back at this bitch, to then be like, you know what? I'm not going to learn my lesson from the last time we had an obviously evil person in charge of the Starship Discovery. Let's install an obviously evil person in star- in charge because it makes for a nice little Ryan. dramatic scene at the end in which the characters who know she's fake look at each other and go, Ooh. and then she can sit in the chair, Giorgio, and smile wickedly. Better the devil you know. But we don't know her. They don't know her. (laughs) Lorca was the devil we knew. No, but they know that she's evil. Oh, 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 that makes it okay then. Oh, well, wrapped up in a bun. I mean... Time for the Hugh Darden. (laughs) Are we ready for the Hugh Darden? I'm ready for the Hugh Darden. He's dead still. Bye. Um, We learned two important things, Mm -hmm. I would say. Um... Number one, he was a good man. And a man that Stamets loved. And a man he loved. And two, Mm -hmm. all the stuff we said at the end of the last episode in which it seems like those conversations he had with Hugh in the mycelial network and the way that the ending scene in the last episode with Paul where he was guiding us out and he kind of has come to terms with what happened to Hugh and, you know, the scenes in which in the last episode he was talking to, or in one of the previous episodes where he's talking to Tilly and he goes, look, I know what happened to Hugh and it's okay. Like, he had become zen with the fact of what happened to Hugh. Yeah. In this episode, they throw that all away so that him and uh, Ash can have a little tiff mm-hmm. yep. to basically him be like, 
I'm glad that you're feeling fucking guilty. Go fuck yourself. And you should feel shit. You killed a good man, a man that I love. If you feel bad, that means there's at least a little bit of humanity in you. And that's what that scene was actually serving. It wasn't Maybe about... Maybe there's some hope for you after all. It wasn't about Paul, and it wasn't about Hugh. What the scene was demonstrating at the end of it was, this is a scene that Ash Tyler is human because he feels bad. There is hope About killing a character who was a good man and a person Paul loved. Two things that we barely ever got demonstrated on screen when Hugh was alive. Sure, he was nice, but we've talked about how Hugh was lacking in the qualities to make him such a great man. And a person he loved... Yes, 100%, but we were told that. We never really ever got to witness it outside of the famous toothbrushing scene. And that's Hugh. I don't mean to offend our writers in any way, but, you know, Hugh was uh, in service of Paul Stamets' character. He was, the, you know, basically who Paul loved. What do you give this episode? A yum or yum yum? I say yum. I, I rated a yum. So the next episode we'll be talking about is Season 1, Episode 15, the apparent fi- final episode of Season 1. It is called, Will You Take My Hand? Rachel, it's a question. How are you going to take my hand? I'll take yours, but I want to touch Star Trek's Discovery's hand. So the IMDb uh, synopsis of this, and there's two of them, by the way. The second one is written by Tantrum1701, so... <laughs> I'm not going to read that one. You can read that one next. Um, with Giorgio, or as Saru called her in this episode, Giorgio. Saving Giorgio may indeed prove to be a grave error in judgment. Giorgio, 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 Giorgio. With Giorgio at the helm of the plan to end the Klingon war once and for all, the USS Discovery crew struggles to fathom and tolerate her hostile tactics. Memories of past hardships are rekindled within Burnham. Uh, that is the episode. I am drained. I am tired. I am frustrated. I am deeply annoyed, dissatisfied. But that's Star Trek Discovery at the moment. There is hope it will get better because I, like we we keep saying, there were moments, there's the first half of season two we remembered enjoying in some way, shape or form. But And there's always we season will three. see. And there's always season three that will eventually be in our universe. You can find us on the social medias of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, all of those. Uh, yum Yum Pod or Yum Yum Podcast. We are always posting questions, link, photos, videos, fun stuff on those. So keep up to date with us on the social medias. Uh, we also have an email, yumyumpod at gmail.com, in which you can email us with your thoughts, questions, concerns, queries, theories on like well ryan i think ash tyler is great that's a game theory like yeah like (laughs) i also you want to be trolled i don't want to be trolled (laughs) i want death threats too yum yum pod at gmail.com we also have a patreon in which we talk about other things we talk about star trek episodes of other star trek shows we talk about the movies and we give our thoughts on other types of TV shows, whether they yeah. be stuff There's like Sherlock, of Doctor extra Who, content over there on various things. So that's our Patreon, as well as access to a private Discord. So. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we also have just other fun posts on there. So look up Yum Yum Pod on the Patreon. It is a fun time. Head on over there if you can, Rachel. Mm-hmm. <sighs> A pleasure talking to you about... I can't even say it. Star Trek Discovery, the episode's over. Rachel, until next time, yum yum? <laughs>